draws upon the power of archives and dialogue and the memory and performance of Munit Singh and the direction of Ping Chong, who we have here. And also later, uh, and also in advance of that, we're going to get to see, um, which is really a treat, um, body painting video um, of Guilty Jones, videoed by Arnie Zin, of uh, Keith Haring uh, painting the body of um, Guilty Jones, um, which you can see the portraits that were um, of the documentation of this in the exhibition at the Gray. And so after this, we'll have a discussion with Ping Chong, Bill T. Jones, and Munit Tseng with NYU's Karen Shimakawa, the chair of the Performance Studies Department. And so we're really happy to note um, also that this discussion will be a part of the Asian Diasporic Visual Cultures in the Americas Journal. So you can relive it if you want to um, pick up a copy of that when it comes out. So um, right now, I'd just like to bring up uh, and welcome the award-winning Munet Tseng. Um, she uh, is the principal of Munet Tseng Dance Projects and also the manager of the estate of Tsung Guan Shi. Um, Munet Tseng, if you would like to come up and um, introduce, oh, sorry, sorry, I'm sorry. My bad. Um, switching this. Uh, <laughs> just kidding. So um, actually, I would like to welcome another award-winning choreographer. <laughs> 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 the inspirational <laughs> artistic director of New York Live Arts and co-founder of the Bill T. Jones Arnie of Vane Dance Company, Bill T. Jones. Thank you very much, Nina. Thank you very much, um, Bing, for allowing me to be part of this. And uh, thank you very much to the Great Gallery for doing such a beautiful show. Uh, I was thinking, what could I possibly say about body painting? Because Kwong and I, we liked each other very much. Um, and it's odd, but when we lost him and Keith and Willie Smith and all the, you know, so many people from that scene, uh, I didn't, it didn't occur to me until even maybe a few years after that that we were doing identity politics. I don't think uh, he and I ever spoke to each other as men of color. Louder, uh, Bill. I don't think he and I ever spoke to each other as men of color, which is something I can't imagine right now. But um, so it is. In about 1983, Arnie Zane got a small uh, video camera. We've been working with video since uh, the Experimental Television Center under Ralph Hawking up in Binghamton, somewhere in the, in the 70s. When we moved down here, everything, we uh, won a couple of grants, so we were able to buy better equipment. And we were, Arnie and I had a duet company, we were touring in England, and uh, Keith and I were good friends, very close. And he said they were gonna be there, and wherever Keith was, was going to be a mix of exciting art being made and a party. <laughs> so we were, we were a little older than a lot of guys in the scene, but we were good friends. And Keith had, uh, in his loft, I don't know if any of you were ever hanging around Keith at that time, you would walk in and you'd see lots of people, lots of pretty girls, pretty boys, and uh, magazines. And Keith, uh, oh, he showed me a magazine, that I think it was in Brazil, or was it Spain, with a really stunningly handsome, I think he was a soccer player, or something like that, uh, in one of Keith's vases from here up, body painted. Had Keith already done um, Grace Jones at that time, I'm not sure. I like to think that I came before Grace Jones. <laughs> uh, someone can check me on that. I came first. And Keith had never done a full body yet. So this thing about identity politics, a black man who strips off, strips naked, and then he does this thing which is so important to uh, exotic people's body decoration with a white guy from Kutztown, Pennsylvania. And that, um, so I'm a little shy in showing it. I'm not a shy person, as you can see, but the years, um, our youth is revealed to us in a way that can be sometimes quite devastating. Um, so here I am, I wanted to not watch the film. I want to be out here, but I think I will just uh, gird my loins, so to speak, and watch it one time. So uh, Keith was going to have a, a show at the Robert Frazier Gallery in London, but we went to another location to do this body painting stunt. I, he never explained to me um, until he was painting four hours, uh, this acrylic paint, 
and you can see it's very intimate. And somewhere along, I said, oh, by the way, uh, the, the press is coming. So can you imagine that? You, you know the, Eng the English tabloids? You know how bitchy and, and the, how they can be? So that's the arrogance of youth, I think. Uh, fully painted, the doors open, and there they are, like a pack of hungry wolves, smart Alex, saying things that are inappropriate. Um, hey, bloke, you forgot your pants, like that sort of thing. <laughs> and the next day it was on the, the cover of, the, not the cover, but on the art page of the standard, these working class pages. And what it was, was this black American painted up like a, a mud man from New Guinea. Um, Kwong uh, was very, very um, kind to me, and he was saying to me, uh, you know, make sure that you flatten the shapes out, because that's how we will see the, uh, the painting. That was a very strong instruction, because it influenced a lot of the way that um, Arnie and I uh, proceeded to make choreography. As I said, Arnie had a brand new camera. He got Keith's permission. Oh, I don't know if he got permission or not, but he did it. He, he photographed the whole thing. We brought back the raw tapes. Um, Tom Bowes, who was the video curator at the kitchen at that time, uh, and I don't know that he and Arnie worked together on it. They, he edited it down, and Tom took it by himself to lay the soundtrack that you will hear, which incidentally, I don't, I'm not sure if we have cleared the rights, but we've never really <laughs> made any money from it. But you'll see, it was very much of that moment, this concert, this music that you'll hear, <coughs> Keith had just been to that concert. And it was in somewhere in Queens that he loved this music. So here we have body painting, it's nine minutes long, shot by Arnie Zane, you might say under the artistic direction <laughs> of Guan Chi, and uh, edited by Tom Bowles of the Kitchen. And uh, I'd like to now introduce <laughs> um, uh, Muna Tseng, um, a choreographer and dancer and head of um, the Muna Tseng Dance Projects, and also the manager of the amazing estate of Tsenggwan Shi. Muna Tseng. Thank you, Alex and um, It's been just amazing uh, for uh, almost two weeks now, or just a week uh, after seeing the opening at the Gray, where um, so many of the actual people that my brother photographed came to the opening. They were literally kind of walking down from the walls. And, um, and then just seeing this amazing uh, Bill and Arnie and bringing back the times. Um, Quanji died in 1990, and he was 39. We had shared a childhood in Hong Kong, and uh, we both came to New York in the late 70s, 1978, to um, become artists in, in the city. And um, after losing him, which was also kind of losing my childhood in Hong Kong, because we shared that and the memory of that, um, I wanted to make a piece about him, the incredible community that uh, they had, and with the um, amazing times that, you know, when we became artists in New York throughout the 80s. He had a 10-year career, basically. He created all that work over at the Gray in 10 years, the different bodies of work. Um, but I didn't quite know how to go about doing it. And um, Slide for Art was made in 1999. Um, I uh, had worked with Ping Chong in uh, 1996 in a piece that was called 98.6, uh, A Convergence in 15 Minutes, which we won't show today. But it was done um, as a companion piece to Slide for Art. And Ping has this wonderful uh, process of interviewing. Um, he basically, we met and we talked. And he um, wrote a, a very beautiful piece in that lasted 50 minutes. Um, and I, I thought Ping would be a, a, a really good collaborator to work on the piece on Quang Chi because 
uh, Ping did not know my brother, is that right? Yeah. And so he could add a kind of objective um, voice and structure to the piece. And um, we, we used his uh, interview process, uh, basically made a list of Quan Chi's friends and colleagues. Bill speaks in it um, as the other friends, and, and um, some, of, some of them are not with us anymore. Um, his partner, Christopher Haynes, who's here uh, tonight with us. And so the, the, the sound score was the interviews, and the music that uh, I wanted to use was all Quan Chi's favorite music. Some of it was from um, my father's LP collection, like Cuban Mambo, which <laughs> my father loved and then Quan Chi loved. So um, I hope you enjoy it. It's 45 minutes long, and um, it's a solo performance that I did. Um, the footage that you see is from, uh, it was first done in 1999. It took me nine years to, before I could, I was ready to make it. And, um, and the footage you'll see tonight is from the 2002 rendition, which was for Ping Chong's 30th um, anniversary season. Uh, it was done at La Mama, and uh, it's a um, two camera edited together uh, videotape of a live performance. I just want to say that the, the ending of that um, um, show was a picture of Quan Chi with his back to us because they actually you can't see it, the ending, it actually cut off uh, with his back to us and then um, what we did was we took him out of the picture. He just uh, vanished out of the picture. And then the names of uh, people in the New York arts community that died of AIDS during the 80s came up all around the image. That's actually how it ends. So I'm really just here to moderate. I think um, there's so much to say about what we've seen and also about the exhibit. If you haven't seen it yet, I really encourage you to go. It's a really, really interesting um, collection. And it's um, so nice to see so many of those images together in one place and to be able to wander back and forth throughout it. Um, so I, uh, I have just a couple questions that I'm going to start us out with, just while you guys are formulating your own questions, or maybe um, you guys have things to say to each other. Um, but actually, maybe we should start with that, or the things that you guys want to say to each other, having just rewatched each other's work. <laughs> I wonder how um, Bong Chi would feel. I don't think he, from what you said in the piece, I don't think he would approve of the work being a nostalgia moment. Mm -hmm. Nostalgia moment. And I think that is really, um, he was doing something very, very important. And as a result, in the show, I find the things that are most compelling are not the party pictures, mm -hmm. not the um, just kids in front of the camera, you know, madcapping, but I think he really nailed it with his landscapes. I think the um, expeditionary was very important. Uh, I think that um, the I, I like the body painting photos, uh, but I think I might put the political ones, the excruciating ones, even before the body painting. It was a nice, they're, they're, they're handsome records of Keats' work. But I think that he really was uh, saying something that was very forward thinking. And um, that, that's, well, what do you think about that idea that there's a tendency now with artists uh, like uh, Huang that, that are associated with the 80s and the AIDS crisis? that it becomes always about looking back. Mm -hmm. I think he stands up very well to looking now. I visited with the younger students and, and the, um, they come in and I've heard them say, wow, you know, this guy, like, is he still around? Is he doing this? So in other words, they think that there's a, uh, that he's among us and um, Yet the work is create was created in almost 30, 35 years ago, mm -hmm. from 1979 to 1989. The technology was totally different, pre-digital, analog film, no Photoshop. Um, some <laughs> of the young people think that uh, he's Photoshopped himself in front of backgrounds. Um, that notion did not exist. And so I think um, 
there's a certain, um, like I said in the piece, he was always in the moment. Mm -hmm. And he captured sort of a timelessness as well. He chose the iconic uh, yeah. urban scenes and nature scenes that is a, you don't know when it's from. So I think that nostalgia thing, I think you're really right. He, mm -hmm. And then that, that photo downstairs of him with the boy, um, with the planets, that was double exposure he did. And he was already like kind of like, you know, time traveling to the planet. So I'm, I'm sure he would be like shooting somewhere out there. <laughs> How does the art establishment understand him in the tradition of the, uh, what do you call it, set up photos? Uh, I saw Roberta Smith, um, I don't know, what was it, really 15 years ago or something at, um, in Chicago? I think it was at the ICA, uh, the International, lecturing on the grand history, starting with the Contessa uh, Castiglione, of course, Cindy Sherman, all of these, and I don't remember if Kwan was in that show. Mm -hmm. And there was, and I thought that that was, I was a bit, uh, I, maybe I'm wrong, but I'd be, be curious to know, but how is he understood now, our historically? I may not be the person to, Lynn Gumpert is here, the director of the Gray Art Gallery. Do you, do you have a few words to say? Um, I think working on the show was, revelatory for me as well, um, having been in New York in the 1980s and knowing of Quan Chi's work, um, I want to emphasize that Amy Brandt um, curated the show and she mentioned that, and she says this again in the catalog, that she did so when she came to the Chrysler as the curator of contemporary art. She saw that the Chrysler had three photographs by Quan Chi in the collection, and she became fascinated and thought, what's the backstory? I haven't heard that much about this artist. And she went to Muna and um, started the conversation that eventually led to the show. It was challenging um, because we met with a lot of resistance um, to the work. And I've said this as well in my introduction, that I think uh, many people have thought that, the, that he did one series only, that he did the East Meets West and Expeditionary series, and that was the sum total of his work. Um, and we were very happy to get two more institutions to take the show. We have a representative from the Block Museum here. It's going to go to Northwestern. Um, after it goes to the Chrysler Museum and it ends up in Boston. But what struck me when we actually got all the works together is the fact that the work is so multi-layered. Um, it's so accessible. You get it. You see it. And then the more you look at it, the more you think about it, the more you realize the levels of complexity and the layers of meaning that he's embedded in these powerful images that are so striking and so beautiful to look at. So, and that this is, I mentioned this to him, I said, where's the student work? You know, how did he come up with this series that was so mature and so complex? And, you know, this was the first work he exhibited in 1979 at the Mud Club. Um, and for an artist to have come up with this wonderful body of work, you just, and then only be able to make it for nine years, 10 years, you wonder what he would have done next. I think that's, you know, what would he have evolved into? What else would he have discovered? But it's been such a privilege to get to know it better. And um, I'm really happy um, that it's been received so well. Does that, end? oh, so I think historically <laughs> he's being recognized again. Um, and I think people are now seeing him um, or beginning to understand the quality, uh, the identity politics that emerged in that body of work. And he was a bit ahead of the crowd, or he was right with them. You know, um, he was exploring it, and I thought it was interesting in the film that he, you know, um, was so resistant to being called Asian American. Um, so mm -hmm. he didn't want that label. He, 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 he thought, uh, our parents gave us, um, for any presents, they would say, where do you want to go? And they would give us a ticket of travel. So 
they instilled in all three kids, I have a younger brother as well, um, this love of travel. And I think he thought of himself as a global citizen. And he did not want to be ghettoized as a Chinese American artist. But at the same time, like you say. Also, there's another art world moment that we should be talking about. Is Gong was just before the um, Chinese, mm -hmm. this, the, uh, 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 well, not the resurgence, but suddenly China was cool central. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, I mean, this work, if, imagine this work being done in 1995 or, or 2000 and uh, for an artist living in Shanghai. Mm -hmm. And it would be going through the roof in that regard. So how does that work? Yes, no, actually, um, this, uh, his work really influenced uh, a lot of the artists um, uh, during the time in the 1990s, the performance artists, a lot of people might know Zhang Huang, for example, the East Village artists, they were greatly influenced by him. Mm -hmm. And actually, um, you know, of course, East Village artists in, in China after the East Village here, so um, definitely. Yeah. I'm, I'm feeling that a familiar um, hurt and passion at this moment. Because there's something that the, um, the AIDS crisis did that um, you, first of all, it's just a bunch of decadent people having too much fun. And um, they did something that was interesting, cute. They were cut down, move on, next. And I feel that some of us who have survived, there is a militancy. Fuck you. It doesn't matter how long the career was. Do the images stick? And we were not sick and dying children. We were using a strategy. We were in a time, but we were making something that was to stand, to last. And it was we were not impotent. We had children. We were cut off, but we had children. We propagated. We added to the culture. Do not make that disease the whole meaning of our lives. And I'm seeing Kwon, and I think that's why we are so glad the show is done. That he was doing something that was, uh, it was a harbinger of what was to come, and it was something those images will continue to be beautiful. Now, do we know uh, the end joke about the Mao suit and the, you know, the, the, the photo and so on? Even then, he does look like an alien that has, has land. <laughs> and that is a, a, a perennial condition for many creative people. Well, the, the story of the Mao suit, um, well, actually, it's a, it's a uh, Chinese suit that was worn by uh, Dr. Sun Yat Sun, the founder of the Republic of China. And um, then later, Mao wore it. And so it became known as the Mao suit. Um, when she bought it in uh, Montreal at a secondhand store. And when we were in New York, first in New York in 1978, our parents came and took us to Windows on the World to dine. And uh, Quan Chi called up and found out that there was a dress code and um, it was suit and tie. He said, I don't have a Western suit and tie, I'm not getting one, but I have a Chinese suit. So he wore that and we arrived at Windows on the World and the maitre d' took one look at him and treated him like a Chinese dignitary of the IP. <laughs> um, we have to remember also that at that time, China was quite closed still. There were not Chinese tourists running around in New York or anywhere else. If there were Chinese visitors, they were officials and often they wore the suit. So, Historically, looking back at the, the times was quite different. That was a different era. And um, so not only was he realized the light bulb moment of this suit represents power, it represents entree. And then he added the ID badge, he added the eyeglasses that blocked out his eyes. And so he definitely was like, okay, I'm going to play your game. And um, another story I'd like to, um, in, 19, in 2004, uh, the Shanghai Biennial invited his work to be part of it. 
And um, so uh, there were about 10 self-portraits shown in Shanghai for the first time. Mm. What, what year was that again? 2004. And um, I went and I met um, artists like Song Dong, and, and they told me that they actually knew of his work. It was being smuggled in through uh, arts magazines into China when they were art students at the academies. And they would um, look at this and they would go, oh my god, this is so interesting. We have to wear the Mao suit because it's the law of yeah. the land. We hated wearing the Mao suit. But look at this guy, he looks really cool <laughs> <laughs> in the Mao suit out in the other world beyond our border that we're not allowed to travel to. I, I really appreciate what you said about like not sort of caricaturing artists from the 80s, the downtown scene in the 80s and all that kind of thing. But um, at the same time, I would like I would say that you're coming to his work through the East Meets West series and the Expeditionary series and not being part of that scene um, and only seeing those portraits for, for a long time. Mm -hmm. What I really appreciate about the show is seeing them all together yes. and seeing like what a whole artist he was mm -hmm. um, and the way that he, and actually how versatile he was as, as an artist, right? Mm -hmm. right? Um, uh, the care, you know, when you see the, the East Meets West photos, which I, you know, the series which I love, um, you, you can sort of see all the compositional things. I'm not an art historian either. I basically know nothing. I don't know why I'm on this. But um, <laughs> you can see like, 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 the beauty of the, of the composition and, and understand it in a kind of visual kind of genealogy, you know, aesthetic tradition and all those kinds of things. But what I really liked about the show is seeing the way he um, is uh, applying these it's really beautiful and precise eye in these really different genres mm -hmm. of photographs. And so I think, you know, I had asked some questions about, you know, tell us about the 80s. But I mean, this part of it was really my curiosity about um, his art process, because uh, you see so much more of it, I think, when you get to compare all these different genres of work that he's doing. Um, so I really, I highly recommend the show. It's just, it's really interesting, and, and the photos are really beautiful. What, what the Maybe I have 80s fatigue, but uh, <laughs> what, what, what is that people want to know about the 80s? I, I think for me, it's partly, uh, I, I would like to not have it be the caricature that you described, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, to really understand it as part of a longer and fuller and more continuous kind of artistic history, rather than just this kind of bubble moment that everybody And we were young. Understand. We were young. And the young are incredibly yeah. self-involved. Yes. And, uh, yeah, they're self-involved. And they are um, extremely, I mean, it's wonderful to be in the moment. Mm -hmm. um, that moment then is maybe not so cute when you're looking at it with 40 years perspective. And the, you know, the bread Proust, you know, the, that last party, and he's always describing these parties. And, and then the last book of Proust, the, now we're the, the same persons are at the parties, but they talk with this little, the, the puffiness under the eyes and the skin, the great beauty, it still looks good until you get closer to her and so on. You know, time is a motherfucker. <laughs> um, and, and, I, and that's what I mean. Not for but, you. Pardon? Not for you. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean, right? It, it, sometimes it's, it's um, that's why we've got to have a lot of respect always for the young. But don't let them control the dialogue. But understand that that is an essential part of human of human experience. You need to have this new, vibrant look at me, look at what I can do. And then some of them, they drop gold, jewels. Now who is there collecting them? And that's part of the human patrimony. I'm so glad my friend is. Uh, the, the work stands up, you know? Congratulations, your brother, you know? The work stands up. And quite frankly, some work is only in a moment, and that's fine as well. But this one, maybe this, this is the jealousy I have as a performing artist with visual artists. You know, that work is now there. The visual artist, uh, performing artist, well, you had to be there, you know? <laughs> That's actually something I, I I wanted to ask you about because I especially the the, the series from the Metropolitan from the gala right I mean to me I see that in some ways as a documentation of a performance art project yes. right really? yes. um, really? and it really was that that was the, the the real work was the performance of the moment and we get to, to see this not just but this documentation of it 
Um, and I was actually curious about your experience of that. And you know, here mm -hmm. you were actually documented as a piece of art. Yeah. But also, I mean, that you have that experience of the, the ephemerality of it and, and not being able to capture all of it. I, I'm not sure if this, if this is a correct response, but um, you can see that Andy Warhol was a very important influence. But I think because of the identity aspect of it, the other, the exotic, the exoticism of him being Chinese, and his uh, was it unconscious political critique going on in it, I think he, he did one he went one beyond Andy Warhol. Mm -hmm. um, it, there, that's, at least that's why the works are important to me, what they say about who is looking mm -hmm. and what is agency and all of those things. Um, but, I mean, what do you think? Is that was, we, Andy Warhol, his shadow is very large here, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And I don't think it's any shame to say that he, that Juan was taking that strategy, that party even, mm -hmm. you know? He and Keith, you know, everybody of that generation was looking up to Andy as the, the father and, you know, the concepts of... Not him. everybody. Oh. <laughs> you know, there were factions. Well, yes. There were factions that I, I will not mention the name of, a friend of mine who was like a big career at that time. And you know that guy, he crashed my party? You know, we showed him the door. You know, you're so cool. You're the new kids that when he comes around and animate everything and an event around him, no, 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 we don't need you. Right? Mm -hmm. So that, there was factions, you know. Yeah, but the the idea of uh, the celebrity that w when he crashed the costume at the Met mm -hmm. uh, party, um, the society, the uptown, and and he had a, a press badge from mm -hmm. Soho Weekly News because it was an assignment. Mm -hmm. um, for you know this incredible paper that Kim Hastrider um, shepherded and allowed all these fantastic editorial uh, pieces to appear in the paper. Um, so it was really playing with this 15 minutes of fame and um, and also asking everyone loves to be photographed. So he set up the perfect kind of uh, performance uh, stage in the grand staircase as they arrive. Mm -hmm. And he asked them, would you like to have your photograph taken? <laughs> <laughs> and he also had a tape recorder and um, recorded the, the interview. No, unfortunately we don't have it. Mm -hmm. We've been trying to track it down, right? Just for the, it's it might be just as well. <laughs> that, that's a movie deal or? Oh, who was it that, or uh, Kissinger's wife, was it? Nancy Kissinger. Nancy Kissinger. Wearing the same Adolfo gown as the other two ladies. Ooh. And how he managed to get, get them all to pose yeah. with him. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think he, he had incredible charm, and, um, and he used that mm -hmm. uh, in the same way, I think, in the way that Warhol might go the mm, mm, kind of playing dumb, but that was his way of mm -hmm. like getting people to reveal themselves. So, um, and then the moral majority. Well, those piece. are great. <laughs> the senators and the um, that party, the Allwell and Buckley. And now that'll be an interesting series to project 20, 30, years because I think the landscapes some of those other things they need, need nothing but to know what the crew was there yeah. you know uh, look, we were in um, a few years ago that uh, a big show Picasso and the Masters at the Louvre remember that and they were you know because Picasso compared himself to every great master uh, <laughs> Velasquez uh, Andre and so on but there was a painting I think it was Andre wasn't of the of, of the, they were the it girls at the time they were not the Grand Horizontal, you know, not the, not the, I, I don't know, but they were there. But that picture, you had to look at it, what you saw was these ruddy-faced, voluptuous uh, 19th century beauties. But when you understand that they were actually scandalous, because these women oftentimes died of tuberculosis, oftentimes, because, and he had made this gorgeous history painting of them. So that painting, you have to know something about it to know why the painting is there. I wonder if these photos, mm -hmm. you will have to have to be told who was William F. Buckley, 
to understand what was going on there. Mm -hmm. You have to be told that now. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, that, and I don't think that's, it is, does that point off for a significant work of art that we're talking about this being in your time and going forward? Is that a problem, do you think? That you have to educate yourself to understand what is going on? Well, I think that, that, that a lot of the, um, the young people now, they, they don't know what happened during the Reagan era. They don't know what kind of politics were being, and very uh, dire um, poli political mm -hmm. decisions were being made by those those people up on the on that panel. Mm -hmm. uh, Terry Dolan, for example, mm -hmm. who then died of himself of AIDS, and um, but he was so anti a lot of the um, mm -hmm. homosexual um, issues and medicine and research for AIDS. Mm -hmm. Harris Echo from Performance Studies, so uh, I shouldn't say this on a panel with a bunch of artists, but in some ways, uh, I, in answer to your question, it doesn't matter. I mean, I think for me, it doesn't, it doesn't, it's not that it doesn't matter, but it's just my, what mine would be, what I would be interested in is what those photos do in different moments for different people, mm -hmm. right? Whether or not you know that particular history, you get something from that image. There's a certain something recognizable about the aesthetic of it, the way it's set up, the, the stance. I mean, they're so beautifully composed in that way that you understand something. You might not understand the specific narrative. Well, Jerry Falwell in a bad suit with a Cheshire grin. <laughs> I mean, you can just say that. <laughs> <laughs> and the suit's not right, and the flag is all wrinkled. You know, I mean, yeah. there are just ways in which uh, there's something, uh, to me, even if you don't read a little placard or you don't know who those people are, there's something askew in those mm -hmm. images that I, that makes you interested and makes you want to dig in more, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, at least for me. For well, the Reagan um, inauguration panel, which oh, was like, um, had Ronald Reagan in his first marriage. It was the wedding picture when he was a Hollywood actor, and then with their friends, uh, William Holden. Exactly. And yes. So, <laughs> you, you know, and they're cutting their wedding cake, and the knife is coming down on the, on the Polaroid. <laughs> That was 1981, you know, in the inauguration. So a lot of people thought that that was from Reagan becoming a president, but you know, he was an actor playing a president. <laughs> <laughs> Little did we know. Um, I, I I imagine that there are um, people in the audience who, but I actually just want to bring Ping in to this a little bit, uh, which is that, um, uh, and I can't because I write about Asian Americans, so I I have to come back to that identity politics question. Um, and to think about, I, I, I'm curious about your uh, you, your relationship to that term, identifying or not identifying in relation to something like I remember <laughs> in the 80s when the multicultural wars were going on, everybody was calling me, what do you think, what do you think, what do you think? <laughs> and, uh, I told you actually. Yeah. And, and, <laughs> and, you know, and, I, and I said, I said I don't. I, I I was like Huang Chi in that sense because I said, I'm an American artist, yeah. you know. And of course, yeah. some people, the Asian, some Asian Americans, held that against me for saying that. But I said, if you're the best of this little corner they put you in, then you're going to be in that corner. Mm. You're marginalized, and we're going to be marginalized in my lifetime still. And you know, I, I said anybody of color in this country is second class citizen, and that's the way it is right now. You know, so. Why give them that advantage and say, you know, I'm mm -hmm. going to be in that corner. I'm an American artist. And has your relationship to that term changed over time? No. no. Yeah. I'm mean, more militant now. Are you more militant? <laughs> <laughs> more militant? Yeah. Well, That's the way I feel as well. Yeah. 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 But you know, I feel that part of the milit militancy has been I proved to myself first that I have a body of work that can stand independent of other ways. Then I can actually enjoy Actually, there's a kind of camaraderie. I don't know how you felt, the wonderful work you did with Meredith and all of that, but I was doing all of these things in the scene, but I, there was a loneliness, an existential loneliness I couldn't put my finger on. And this, you can be the prodigal. The prodigal has its own payback. You know, I'm a badass, and I'm, sort of, I'm, I'm, I'm superior because I've been able to survive outside the traditional soil that I'm supposed to be in. But I think that gets old. I think we begin to look for tradition. I think we begin to look for 
uh, I think we, at least I speak for myself, we want to feel a part of something. And I want to feel that I've made the world, uh, I've expanded the world's understanding of what a black artist can be. And I haven't, it doesn't take anything away from me to be called a black artist now. And it used to really offend me. I felt that I was in a ghetto. Mm -hmm. that way. I'm wondering how it was uh, for you to work with Muna on a project that was so incredibly personal. I've been working on uh, using the interview process when when we did this. I had what year was this again? 1999. Yeah. So I've been um, working with the interview process, asking people personal questions for since 92. So I had a lot of, lot of, I'm used to doing it. So it wasn't, it, I didn't think twice about once Muna, because the other thing is the first piece I did with Muna, the 15 minute piece, I interviewed Muna, and then the piece emerged out of, out of that interview. So it was just a continuation of that, because in fact, the story about Kwong Chi going to the World Trade Center was in the first piece. You know, so we already had started that process in a way. And then when Muna came and said, I want to do a full piece about Kong Chi, I went, it's like continuation of what we had started. Mm -hmm. So it was very, very normal for me to do that. It was a, a, a common ground of our culture and understanding of like family, importance of food, uh, <laughs> Kanji might not have been interested in his culture, but he was interested in Chinese food. <laughs> That's one thing you don't give up as a Chinese person, no matter what. Um, I was really interested in this idea in um, Sun Kwang Chi's work of what has been described as blankness or alienness, this sort of um, the idea that a lot of identities were prescribed to him, um, and that in his reaction to that is what we see in in his work. And I was wondering, as people that have worked with him and have known him personally, what do you think? Um, how would you describe his lived experience of the identities prescribed to him that might have um, given force to his work that might have um, informed the way in which he related to? to America and race and identity and how that showed up in his work. I think he, he found his community pretty early. And I think once you find a community, you're less alone. And um, his community was East Village. They were... Um, performance artists, visual artists. It was, it was um, basically, you know, kindred souls. And so um, he, uh, when he was not wearing the Chinese suit, he wore t-shirts and jeans and, you He know, always looked really good. He always <laughs> looked really good. <laughs> In a different way than a lot of other people, didn't he? He was a bit older, you know. I mean, he, he was born in 1950. He was a, a older than, than most of his friends. Yeah, I was 52, so I, I thought he and I were the same age, but he yeah. was older. And um, he had lived in Paris, and he was very interested in fashion. Actually, I, I told Lynn that actually how he supported himself was he was doing you know, commercial art, he was doing fashion shoot, he designed ski suits up in Montreal, he, you know, like, so, um, he, he, uh, Andrew Bolton, who is the curator at the Metropolitan Museum, um, the show is opening next week called China Through a Looking Glass. And it's how different fashion designers um, take China as inspiration. And uh, it's, it's funny because Quan Chi's suit is in the exhibition <laughs> on a mannequin. So he's going to be back at the Met next week. <laughs> and uh, also they, they have, um, they have uh, one of his self-portraits of Statue of Liberty there. And Andrew Bolton told me that when he was a young curator of uh, fashion at um, uh, Victoria and Albert Museum in London, he's British, he said that when he saw Quan Chi's work in a book, 
it really um, made sense to him that he could he could me um, meld the world of fashion with art. I it would be interesting to ask Andrew if he thought of him as a Chinese artist. You know, like it's it's like I, and I'm curious, Lynn. Like you said, you met with resistance to the show, and I wonder what re what what does that mean? that it was difficult to put together the tour. We got many, many rejections. We wrote to many, many museums. Um, and um, we were very pleased when we, when we found um, you know, um, two other museums to take the show. So it, we wrote, I don't know, over 100 letters. Um, I think there's still that um, Veneer that the 80s was populated by a lot of people who were not serious. I, I think you're right. I think that might have been part of it. And then um, we also had trouble. We got rejected by a lot of funding sources. Mm. Uh, is uh, race an issue? Would you, could you identify like what the resistance was? I mean, or is this too blunt and yeah, I don't, I not PC? I, I think mm -hmm. um, my when I talked with people, um, or I talked and said, you know, why not? I mean, I got some very interesting responses, and it's a diff. I mean, I must say that we get over 200, 300 proposals a year for shows to come to, especially to New York, and we're very privileged in that everybody wants the show to come to New York. Um, but there are many, many wonderful exhibitions that don't make it to New York, um, and I think. Uh, it's generally more difficult to travel exhibitions because budgets are restricted and people are doing more shows from their collection and they aren't, you know, they're just, it's, it's a tougher economic world for the arts than it had been. And I think the gentleman is, um, I, I'm sorry, Go ahead. I think the gentleman is really skirting around something which is very sensitive. And I know that Kwong's partner is here. So you can tell me to just shut the fuck up if you like. <laughs> what did you think about me saying that Kwong was described as a snow queen? I think you're right. <laughs> <laughs> this, this is an answer to your question, how he thought about it. Uh, well, please, you want to you speak about what does that mean uh, to you? He just like Caucasian men. <laughs> mm -hmm. He just liked Caucasian men. Uh, we're allowed, right? We're allowed our <laughs> orientations. Well, at the same time, I, I was attracted to Asian men, so. <laughs> <laughs> oh, look out! <laughs> yeah. But the gentleman was saying about him being, having things projected on to him as the, as the, the mysterious visitor from the East. But, but actually, he was very much of this culture. And he liked this culture, and even, I dare say, preferred it to the East. Uh, so uh, I'm trying to pick up what you were asking, sir, about how was he, when he was not in the mild suit, uh, how was his lived experience, quote? Well, there, he also said something which I think shed some light. Um, when he was making his work, um, he was obviously in his mild suit, or his, mm -hmm. you know, that it is very ironic, as has been pointed out, that Sun Yat-sen started wearing this. And so it's, it's something, one of the things that I learned in, in working on the show. But he said, and I forget which interview this came from, um, but when people asked him what he was doing, he said, I am a conceptual artist from New York. <laughs> um, and I'm making my work. You know, so I think um, that that's, you know, a, a really valid answer. And what does that mean? It meant that he was part of this artistic community, that he wanted to be taken as an artist. You know, nobody likes, as you said, being pigeonholed or defined in any kind of way. You want your work to speak, I would imagine, for itself. And Except sometimes you want to be a hot piece of Asian tail. <laughs> yes. <laughs> and you're looking for the uh, occasion of your imagination. <laughs> and that's what I call pigeonholing. And sometimes it works. 
So it's very complicated, the density, isn't it? It's very complicated. Yeah. Uh, but I, I like the fact that, you know, yes, as we just said, he loved New York. And, um, you know, I am from New York. Mm -hmm. um, and this is where I, you know, I make my work mm -hmm. in New York. And uh, Hong Kong in the 1950s and uh, 60s, we left Hong Kong in 1966. But Hong Kong is a complex identity as well. Yeah. It's an island that um, was still under British rule. Um, he went to St. Joseph's Boys School, a Catholic school. Um, my parents um, had lots of British friends. Mm -hmm. And so there was a, uh, um, like, it would have been quite different if we had been born and raised in China, in mainland. My parents escaped the communists in 49, they came to Hong Kong, and then they escaped again in 66 when there was Cultural Revolution uh, making tremors across the border. And they didn't want to run away again from the communists. And so, you know, it's, it's a very complex thing. I, I, if I think of how we grew up and how our parents kind of brought us up, um, I must say that race was not so much an issue. It was not an issue until identity politics became the syllabus in universities. And that pretty much happened in the 1990s. And I'm going to take it a little bit further and say that I, when I'm in a kind of provocative mood in my milieu, where people are so progressive and all, I say that this world is populated with refugees from the middle classes. Class, more than race. Yes. And as someone said to me the other day, um, we on the left are much more comfortable talking about racial differences than we're talking about class. And so Kwong was educated spoke French so well that he said, well, said, you must be, what was that compliment which sounded so bizarre about his speaking French so well? Ambassador from China. You must be <laughs> ambassador from China. You know, so his class was his calling. Mm -hmm. And I think that's something that we uh, forget in identity politics. The class is oftentimes the very secret. The unspeakable. The unspeakable is class and education. I think I think you, uh, when when I worked with Muna on the first piece, I, uh, you know, Muna told me about something which we didn't actually put in the, in the first piece, but it, but it, but I was curious about uh, Kong Chi in, in this context, which is they <coughs> Muna's family, Muna and her bro her brother and her parents moved from Hong Kong to Vancouver, Canada, mm -hmm. which is a whole different world in the '60s, right? In the early '60s. '66. And it was very traumatic for Muna, so I can't imagine that it could have been that easy for your brother. Oh no, no, he. Yeah, so I, I'm just saying that that has a big influence on who, who you know, who he is in, in the context of the West. How was he traumatized? Vancouver in 1966 had a Chinatown. Mm -hmm. My parents did not land in Chinatown. We lived in a white uh, suburb, went to a school, high school, when she was 16. Uh, a difficult time. A difficult time anyway. He was the, he and I were the only Chinese in the school of white Canadians. Uh, it was, he took refuge in art, which is, in the first piece, that's a line from there. Um, and I think the, um, you know, he, he really couldn't wait to get out to become who he became. Uh, I think we experience racism in Canada. <coughs> Maybe that's one of the reasons, you know, we really needed to get out as fast as we could. Um, what, he what also- What did it look like? In, 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 in it's kind of podunk, I would think. I think he maybe dealt with it a little better than I did. I just became, you know, I had locked jaw for three years and he couldn't speak, and so I went into dance. He was, he had art, you know, he was like the prodigy, you know, because he had taken landscape, painting, and whatnot, calligraphy. So he would be doing, you know, murals in the high school lobby, and mosaic, and things like that. Uh, and he 
and he loved, um, he joined the Gilbert and Sullivan <laughs> Club <laughs> Society and he dressed, he was Giuseppe in his velvet uh, balloon uh, um, as in the gondolier. So, I, I, <laughs> he just had a way of finding himself out, of, you know, himself well, out of. What you said was you, you experienced racism, what, what, what was that? It, it just felt like nobody wanted you there. Mm -hmm. You know, it felt like you don't belong. And it's like, you know, it's like you should go to Chinatown. There was also a cultural difference be being a, uh, a citizen of the Crown Colony of Great Britain, culturally mm -hmm. moving to, to Podunk, Canada, too. Because <laughs> 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 Muna said, you know, Muna said that she would say things like, no, I'm pleased to meet you. My name is Susan Zhang. Would you like to have afternoon tea with me? That was going on in Florida, Canada. <laughs> and I had a British accent. <laughs> a fake British accent. And it's um, it's a documentary theater work with five Muslim youth mm -hmm. who um, all all lived through um, the 9/11 event, mm -hmm. and it's for them to have an opportunity to tell the rest of us what it's like to be Muslim in New York and in the United States. Mm -hmm. So it's coming to Canada. It's this week and next week. Uh, I was extremely kind of. You know, one, you know, it was such a wonderful choice to have Gustav Mahler's music to which you dance. So I asked out for my brother. And uh, I was just trying to get back to the film and to find out how a dancer like Bitty Jones would comment or would like to speak about her dance, if you saw that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. Well, the, the music is grand and the feelings were grand. And also it was from the death of Venice, you know, it was so wonderful. Yes. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. That was taken mm -hmm. by you know, Venice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kind of well, it's, an, it's another way that I have to look at it when someone says, this is a dance for my brother. <coughs> and that is, um, it's, it's hard to look at. And yet, you, uh, it's hard not to look at. And if you've been there, it, um, it, it's very difficult to be, if you're talking about uh, artistically judging, it's so connected to her experience of it. And um, the Mahler, um, it's a great piece of music. You know, it was, it was, it was one of his favorite pieces. It was his favorite. Yeah. Ah, I so I, I was very curatorially, very strict, mm -hmm. that it had to be music that he liked. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But, but did you have this was his film in mind of Death in Venice as well? Ah, yes, of course. Of course. That's funny, I didn't know. I, I felt I mean, that was association, yeah. but I didn't yeah. think of it that yeah. way. Thank you. <laughs> 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 